I had gone to art school for a year between high school and art school, four years at MassArt, a year at Rhode Island School of Design, some work in the Army. And I had gotten, picked up a job in a direct mail advertising firm doing paste-ups, pasting up business reply cards, all that sort of thing. And they also asked me if I could do cartoons because they did little simple little black and white cartoons. They said, sure. So I ended up doing that mostly. Worked for that for about two years at $50 a week and decided to go out freelancing. And the very first thing I did the very first day of freelancing, sat down at a desk not being paid, sat down at my desk and the first thing I did was I did a children's book because it was easy, it was fun. Why not do work that's fun? I wasn't particularly interested in doing work that was dull. The reviewer at the New York Times chose it as one of the 10 best illustrated books of the year, which news to me, that seemed to allow me to do work. I used to do four or five books a year. The uh, books went out and started to sell. They either sell or they don't. So you never know which one's going to sell. So you do lots of books and you hope that enough of them will sell enough copies to make a living. I got Ed Emberley's Big Green Drawing Book when I was probably about seven years old, six years old. Suddenly here was this way to draw all these cool little things using very simple shapes that everybody could draw. A square, a triangle, a circle, letter D, letter U, letter C, a squiggle, a dot. With Ed's help, you could combine them infinitely. He just wanted you to have fun. If you have fun with it, you'll keep doing it. If you keep doing it, you'll get better at it. If you keep doing it and you keep getting better at it, you'll keep feeling good. And those little successes, the little tiny successes were what it was all about for Ed. If I wanted to have a, a card, which is Ed Emberley Bookmaker, or even shorter than that, Ed Emberley Bookie. I love books, I love to make books. I drew the artwork over a two-week period, maybe a three-week period. Sent it off to the publisher. They sent me back the book, and within a year they'd return the artwork to me, and I would leave it in the wrapped package, and I would stick it up in the attic, and I never looked at it after that. I was more interested in doing the next technique, so I started to get great pleasure from making sure, going out of my way, to not use the same technique twice. When I first had the opportunity about 10 years ago to visit Ed at his Ipswich home and see the studio where everything was made, and in this room, full of art, just full of art, I just had to dig through and dig through and dig through, and that room just keeps giving amazing gems. And maybe 15% of his books are still in print. But he kept going and he kept going and he kept going because that's how you sustained yourself and your family economically. And how he sustained himself artistically was by being restless and trying all these new styles and new ways and not getting stuck in the same thing. I think the cumulative effect of all that is really dizzying and it's amazing because you can see a guy who is able to create in so many different ways. But of course the funny other side of it is that Nobody can catch up with you. It takes, it takes maybe a museum show when you're 85 years old to catch up with you and actually put all this in context. We wanted to find an exhibition and an artist that we could celebrate, but also that would speak to us, speak to our public, and speak to a story that we wanted to tell. Great art tells stories. He's not just a, incredibly gifted artist, but he's a master storyteller. He's just able to weave together all these different narratives and tell not just one story, but many stories. He's something very special, and that's why to celebrate him in a museum context is what this is about. It's about elevating his work and, and saying that this person belongs in the canon of other artists that we celebrate and talk about in a museum.
Ed Emerly's work really does speak to intergenerational audiences of all types. The biggest joy of bringing this exhibition to the Whistler Art Museum for me has been how our audiences respond to his work. Since he has been living and working and publishing for over 60 years, you'll see such a vast variety of changing and evolving works of art, and this exhibition is special because of that. I know something about art museums of a high quality. I never thought any of my drawings would end up maybe on the wall of the restroom or had little scraps of paper floating around, but not hanging up, especially not a nice museum like the Worcester Art Museum. He's just a rare artist. I think of all the projects I'll be able to do in my lifetime, there will never be another project like this. Thank you, Ed Emberley. Thank you for giving me these books and for giving me a chance to believe in my own self. I have memories of his drawing books. Other adults are gonna have those memories as well. So hitting on those memories of picture books growing up, people are gonna respond in many different, very personal ways to this exhibition. I think everyone has something that they can take away from his work. For me, it's a real treat, of course, to be able to work with a guy who meant a lot to me as a kid, continues to mean a lot to me, and, you know, do a victory lap for the guy. My job is not to convince people that I'm a great artist. Uh, my job, especially with children of all kinds, my job is to give. Teaching empowerment is what all of the drawing books are about. For children especially, the drawings live. The story actually exists. That's what the magic is. Anyway.